Hi, I'm Steve. You can call me Steve. Welcome to episode 100 of Science Isn't Scary. I couldn't let a milestone like that go by without doing something a little special. So I got out of my echoey little room and into the great outdoors. These particular outdoors weren't always so great. I live in Sudbury, Ontario in Canada. And 50 years ago, all of this greenery was barren moonscaped. The reason there are any trees around at all today is because of that, the super stack. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Northern Ontario has been inhabited by the First Nations people for thousands of years, most recently by the Anishinaabek. Europeans arrived in the 1880s with the Canadian Pacific Railway. At first, Sudbury was supposed to be just a small administrative post along the railway, but it quickly grew into a vibrant lumber town. This lasted about three years, until the discovery of nickel and copper deposits that transformed Sudbury into the mining town it still is today. Sudbury's mineral wealth is quite literally astronomical. The city lies in and around the Sudbury Basin, which is the crater left behind by an asteroid impact 1.8 billion years ago. Okay, I should point out that while I live in Sudbury, I'm from British Columbia, which is the part of Canada with all the mountains. Sudbury's urban core lies just south of the crater. Immediately after the impact, it was probably a very impressive crater, but after 1.8 billion years of erosion, it's barely noticeable. There are a few small communities in the crater proper, collectively called the Valley. I've driven through them and not realized I was in the Valley, because the Valley Wall is this. A hillock so small it would barely show up in BC. I spent 13 years living in the Okanagan Valley, which looks like this. Now that's a valley. So what does this have to do with the super stack? I'm getting there. That asteroid impact was so enormous that it actually cracked the crust of the planet. The Earth has a solid rocky outer layer 30 kilometers thick that floats on an ocean of molten rock called the mantle. That molten rock is magma when it's underground and lava when it's on the surface. And that magma tends to be richer in metals than the crust. When Earth was first forming, it was a mostly molten ball of rock and metal. Melted rock and metal are liquid, and they don't really mix all that well. And when you have two liquids that don't mix, they tend to separate out by density. This is oil, and this is water. Oil and water don't mix, so they separate. Water is denser, which means it packs more weight into the same volume than oil does, and heavier things go to the bottom. Metal is heavier than rock, so rocky things tend to float on metallic things. Look at this periodic table. Things get heavier the further you go down the table. That's not due to density, that's just how the table is organized. This is carbon way up here, which is what we're made of. This is silicon, which is what rocks are mostly made of. This is iron way down here, which is the most common metal in the planet, along with nickel and copper and other interesting things. The core of the planet is a solid ball of spinning iron. The mantle envelops the core, and the crust floats on top of everything. It's not a clean separation. The mantle is a mixture of rock and metal, but it's got a lot more metal in it than the crust, because it's further down, and that's where the metal sank when the planet was formed. The further down you go, the more pressure there is, and when that asteroid put a hole in the crust, that pressure forced the magma up through cracks all the way to the surface, bringing a lot of copper and nickel with it. The Anishinaabek have been mining small amounts of that copper for thousands of years. And when the railroad came through, large-scale mining began. So what's that got to do with the super stack? I'm getting there, I promise. Most of the easily accessible copper and nickel were mined decades ago. So now we're after the really deep stuff. There are dozens of mines around Sudbury, many of them well over 8,000 feet deep, or two and a half kilometers. It's these deep mines combined with really stable rock that makes Sudbury the ideal home of a neutrino lab, like Snow Lab, where I'm standing now. Sudbury is on the Canadian Shield, which is some of the oldest rock on the planet. Not only is it extremely seismically stable, but most of the trace radioactive elements in it have long ago decayed away, which is good for the neutrino and dark matter detectors, because trace radioactive elements play havoc with them. Being located in northern Ontario, Sudbury's weather is heavily influenced by Hudson Bay, 
which tends to spread the cold around with a shovel. More than one researcher visiting from a tropical country has asked why that asteroid couldn't have hit someplace warmer. So what does all this have to do with the super stack? I'm getting there, I promise. When I say metal, you're probably thinking of something like this, solid, conductive, shiny, metallic. This is metal in its elemental or reduced form. Very few metals occur in the rocks in their elemental forms. Gold, silver, platinum, and platinum adjacent metals are the only ones commonly found in metallic form. Copper can sometimes be found that way, called native copper, but it's usually mined from an ore. Ores are minerals that contain large percentages of metals. These minerals are usually compounds, which means the metals are found in company with other elements. In Sudbury, that other element is sulfur, with the compound being nickel sulfide. There's a step in the refining process where everything is melted down, and the rock floats to the top of this molten mixture, just like in the mantle. That molten rock is skimmed off as slag, and mostly slag is just dumped in giant piles like this. Watching a slag pour was an exciting thing to do on a Sudbury Saturday night back in the day. Mostly those piles just sit there, but some of that slag is used for fill in construction projects around town. I found a couple of pieces once one day and brought them home just because they look neat. They've still got a little bit of metallic content in them, which is why they sound like this. So what does this have to do with the super stack? I'm getting there. So now we have rock-free metal sulfide, which needs to be made sulfide-free. From here, it goes to the smelter or refinery, which is a stone's throw from my backyard. It's a huge, sprawling industrial complex. And at some point in the past hundred years, someone decided it was a good idea to build a residential neighborhood right next to it, called Coppercliff, which is where I happen to live. There's a reason we have zoning laws now. There are a lot of chemical processes that go on in there, and there's a very, very tiny chance that something noxious could get released. Modern safety precautions are extremely effective, and one of those precautions is being ready to respond quickly if that tiny chance actually happens. There are warning sirens to alert the nearby community, and every Monday they test them. It sounds like foghorns arguing. The most important chemistry that happens there is the reaction that turns nickel sulfide into nickel metal and sulfur dioxide gas. The nickel metal gets sold, and the sulfur dioxide gets blown away. For most of human history, the attitude towards industrial waste was, once it's off the property, it's someone else's problem. Anything gaseous went up the chimney, and anything else got dumped in the nearest river. This still happens today in areas of a Republican persuasion. Anyway, for decades, the nickel industry in Sudbury spewed tons and tons of sulfur dioxide out of their chimneys, or stacks. See, I mentioned a stack. This was perfectly in line with the regulatory standards of the day, in that there weren't any. Once in the air, the sulfur dioxide combined with water and a little more oxygen to form sulfuric acid, which came back down as acid rain. It's not just the mining industry that's guilty of this. Acid rain has been a widespread problem for decades because most fossil fuels contain a little bit of sulfur. Coal-burning power plants and gasoline-powered vehicles were also major contributors. These days, most of that sulfur gets removed before the fuel in question is burned. Diesel fuel has different grades depending on how much sulfur it contains. Diesel fuel is classified into different grades depending on how much sulfur is still there. I should emphasize that nowadays I feel perfectly safe living next to the smelter. In Vancouver, there's a giant pile of sulfur just sitting on the waterfront opposite Stanley Park, the product of all the oil refineries that turn Alberta oil into gasoline. That enormous yellow pile is one of my earliest childhood memories. And it was a much fonder memory before I knew what it represented. Anyway, before we became environmentally conscious, all that sulfur ended up on the landscape as acid and killed a lot of plant life. In most places, it was fairly dilute acid, so the effects on the plant life were stunted growth and loss of leaves. In Sudbury, because there was so much smelting going on, and because due to a quirk of weather the acid fumes couldn't disperse, the local geography got a much, much higher dose of acid. It wasn't melt-your-face-off acid. I mean, people could still walk outside in the rain without getting burned. But they also had the option of going inside and not getting rained on. Trees don't have that option. And when the acid soaks into the soil where they draw their nutrients, they don't last long. Of course, by that point, most of the trees were gone anyway, 
either logged to be turned into lumber or cut down and burned during the early days of smelting when it was done on a giant pile of burning wood and not in a modern industrial plant. The Sudbury area went from thriving forest to moonscape in a few decades. It wasn't just plant life that succumbed to the acid. In many places, the rocks themselves were burned black. Sudbury has fairly thin soil, and you can see rocks sticking out of the ground in many places, including people's front yards. All this exposed silicate had no place to go, but only suffered cosmetic damage because unlike trees, rocks aren't alive. In a lot of places, construction or erosion has revealed rock that was buried while the acid rain was happening. This part of the rock has been burned black, while these patches here show the rock's natural colors. There's an urban legend that NASA sent the Apollo astronauts to Sudbury to train because it looked like the moon. That's not true. They did send astronauts, but for the same reason that the miners and the physicists came here, the impact crater. The astronauts were being trained to look for the signs of meteorite impacts because the moon consists mostly of meteorite crater. These are shatter cones, a record of the impact written into the rock itself. I guess anything they found that didn't look like that would therefore be interesting. Around about the early 70s, people everywhere got sick of living in knee-deep industrial waste and demanded that something be done about it. This led to the creation of the environmental movement, which pushed for cleaning up rivers and lakes, and eventually the creation of Captain Planet and his mullet. Here in Sudbury, the company that owned the Copper Cliff Refinery, Inco, decided to do something about all the acid they were spewing into the air. Rather than, you know, clean anything up. They just decided to release it over a wider area. This is where the super stack comes in. See, I told you I get there. The stack is a really tall chimney. The idea being it can release its vapors into a higher layer of the atmosphere where it'll get blown away and disperse farther. This comes from the maxim, the solution to pollution is dilution. The idea being you still release toxins into the environment. You just dilute them way, way down to below toxic levels. It's an idea that has some obvious flaws, because some things are still toxic even in small doses. It's a method taken by entities that don't really want to spend a lot of money on pollution control. To get the gases up that high, the super stack rises 381 meters, that's 1250 feet for those of you who refuse to learn metric. By comparison, the newer stacks beside it are 173 meters tall, or 500 feet. The Superstack achieved its design goal in that you can now measure small amounts of acid in lakes hundreds of kilometers away, instead of large amounts right at the base. It also put a permanent white haze in the sky, because most solutions end up causing more problems. Acid rain isn't the only pollution it spread around. The stack was the exit point for every form of waste that could be moved by a fan or a blower. This included not just the sulfur gas, but airborne heavy metals and other contaminants. Sulfur deposits tend to contain small amounts of arsenic, because arsenic comes right below sulfur on the periodic table, and things in the same column tend to have the same properties, which means they all end up in the ground together. Arsenic doesn't form a gas quite as readily as sulfur does, which means it comes out of the air a lot quicker, which means the soil in Copper Cliff has arsenic levels a little higher than the surrounding regions. There's higher levels of lead and other stuff as well. Again, this is why we developed zoning bylaws. Despite its flaws, the super stack did stop the intense acid rain in Sudbury proper. What was once barren gravel is now covered in lush, healthy forest. The stack started operating in 1972, 48 years ago. And in those five decades, the ecosystem has recovered magnificently. It didn't come back all at once, and it needed some help. There were local efforts to neutralize the acidic soil with lime, which is basic, and to scrub the worst of the blackness from some of the more picturesque rocks. Ramsey Lake, located in the middle of the city and surrounded by homes and parks, was rehabilitated and turned into something you and your dog would be willing to swim in. A major tree planting effort has been made as well. Over the years, three million trees have been planted, most of them birches that thrive in acidic soil. There's still a ways to go, and a lot of research programs at Laurentian University study the effects of the mining industry, past and present, on the local ecosystem. But the re-greening of Sudbury is a major environmental success story. Having served for 50 years, the super stack is coming to the end of its life. Valet, the mining company that bought Inco, invested a billion dollars in upgrades to its facilities to remove pollutants from its waste streams before they get released. 
this is a much, much better approach to pollution control than simply diluting it and hoping for the best. And it means the super stack is now surplus to requirements. Emissions from the smelter have been reduced by 85%, and the remaining gases can be handled by the new efficient stacks next to it. As I'm filming this, the super stack is being used as a backup for those stacks should they encounter teething troubles. But very soon it will be decommissioned, with dismantling to take place over the following years. Whatever its legacy, the stack has cast a literal shadow over Sudbury for decades. I'm standing very close to the spot where I first saw the stack six years ago, coming into town for a job interview at Snow Lab. Two generations have grown up underneath it. In Toronto, people navigate by the CN Tower, whereas in Sudbury, people determine the location relative to the super stack, as evidenced by the sheer number of shots of me standing somewhere with the stack in the background. Thanks for watching. I've been Steve.